Buonasera. Good evening. I love Italy. If I were born again, I'd be born again here. It's nice to be here in Sardinia. Beautiful place. But now I'm going to start with a somber note. GDP, GDP is slowing in every region of the world tonight, everywhere, not just here. Productivity is waning in every single region of the world tonight, not just here. Unemployment is high in every country in the world, not just here. We're beginning to glimpse a long sunset for one of the great economic eras in world history. But we're also beginning to glimpse the sunrise of a completely new economic paradigm that's going to transform the way all of us organize our economic life on this planet in the next two decades. This is going to come quick. To understand the crisis and the opportunity, we need to have a fix on how the great economic paradigm shifts in history occur. If we know how they occur, we're going to be able to get a road map here in Sardinia and every other region so that we can navigate into this new journey in history. There have been seven great economic paradigm shifts in history. They share a common denominator. At a certain moment of time, three new technologies emerge and converge to create what we call in engineering a general purpose technology platform, a new infrastructure for completely reorganizing our temporal, our spatial relationships, our economic activities, and the way we conceive of society. What are those three technologies? Number one, new communication technologies to more efficiently manage economic activity. Number two, new sources of energy to more efficiently power economic activity. Number three, new modes of transportation to more efficiently move economic activity. When new communication technologies converge with new sources of energy and new modes of transportation, they change the way we manage, power, and move economic life across the value chains. It's as simple and complex as that. Let me give you two examples. First Industrial Revolution, 19th century. Second Industrial Revolution, 20th century. The Brits took us into the First Industrial Revolution. They took us from manual print presses, a German invention, to steam-powered printing, a big leap forward in communication. More productivity, cheaper costs. Then the Brits laid telegraph systems across the UK. Steam power printing in the telegraph converged with a new energy source in England, cheap coal from the hinterlands. Then the Brits came up with a new harvesting technology called the steam engine. Then they put the steam engine on rails to create locomotives for national transportation networks for national markets. And the result is we began to create dense urban life with cities of a million people. 20th century, second industrial revolution, United States. Centralized electricity, and especially the telephone. The telephone was a big deal for the first time, imagine, in all of history, human beings communicating with each other across vast distances at the speed of light. The telephone and later radio and television, those communication technologies converged in the U.S. with cheap Texas oil wells, powered by a German invention, the internal combustion engine. Then Henry Ford put everybody on the road with cars, buses, and trucks, cheap. We built out metropolitan areas, the suburbs, the shopping malls, 
we created a second industrial revolution. And that revolution took us through the 20th century. It peaked, peaked in July 2008. If you remember that month, Brent crude oil hit a record of $147 a barrel on world markets for oil. And in July of 2008, purchasing power shut down all over the world. That was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. Because everything in the second industrial revolution depends on fossil fuels. Fertilizers, pesticides, construction materials, pharmaceutical products, synthetic fiber, power, transport, heat, and light, all of it's made out of carbon and moved by carbon. We have spent two centuries and two industrial revolutions digging up the burial grounds of a previous period of history, the Carboniferous Age, and we created this great short-lived civilization, which is now taking us to the potential of extinction as early as the end of this century with climate change. That's the history of the moment. So when oil started to go over 100 a barrel in 2007, all the other prices for everything we buy in the stores, not just our petrol, everything went up. Our homes, construction, pharmaceuticals. At 147 a barrel, we all stopped buying. This is the beginning of the great end game for the Second Industrial Revolution and the way we understand how to organize economic life here in this square today. Let me share an anecdote with you. When Angela Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first couple of weeks of her new government to help her address the question, how do we regrow the German economy? When I got to Berlin, the very first question I asked the new chancellor, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy or the European Union economy or the global economy in the last stages of a great economic era where the energies have matured, the technologies based on those energies have no more productivity, and the infrastructure is old. And on that first day with the chancellor, I laid out an architectural plan for a new convergence of communication, energy, and transportation, a third industrial revolution. And at the end of the day, the new chancellor said, Jeremy, we will have this for Germany. I'm going to report back to you what's happened in the 10 years since that first meeting. But first, what is this new convergence of communication, energy, and transport, this third industrial revolution? The communication internet, Everyone here has their smartphones. The communication internet, which has matured for 25 years since the World Wide Web, that communication internet is converging right now in Germany, and now we're working with the leadership in China. It's converging in Germany with a new digitalized renewable energy internet and a nascent automated GPS guided and very soon driverless transport and logistics internet. When I mean very soon, I mean this coming year. We are seeing three internets come together and converge in a super internet, communication, energy transport, digital, 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 totally connected. And these three internets for communication, energy, and automated transportation logistics, they're a kernel, a kernel and they ride on top of a new platform called the Internet of Things. Now we're hearing a lot about the Internet of Things. We are attaching sensors to every device, every machine, every appliance, across the value chains and all the way into the natural environment. So they can monitor what's going on and send data to each other and to all of us. We have sensors in the agricultural fields watching the crops grow and sending data. We have sensors in the factories, sensors in the warehouses, sensors on smart roads, sensors in smart homes and in smart vehicles, 
and they're collecting data and sending it in real time to the communication, energy, and transport infrastructure. By 2030, these technology connections will be ubiquitous. Every machine is going to be talking to every other machine. What we're seeing for the first time, the human race has created an external brain so that the cognitive consciousness, the human race, can operate on an external platform. For the first time in the 175,000 years anatomically modern humans have been here, the whole human race can directly engage with each other with economic activity and bypass all the middlemen, the intermediaries, the vertically integrated centralized institutions, the elite organizations of the world. We can directly engage each other in economic life as one extended, diversified human family. Not just on Facebook and not just Skyping in the classroom, but across the economy. This is a big leap forward potentially for the human race. But our first moment we say, this is exciting. And the second moment we said, we're terrified. With everything's connected to everything and everyone, how do we assure network neutrality? in this Internet of Things world? How do we make sure governments don't control this Internet of Things platform for their own political ends? How do we ensure that big corporations and industries don't try to exploit this domain for their own purposes? How do we protect privacy? How do we protect data security? How do we thwart cyber crime and cyber terrorism and natural catastrophes that can throw down the system. These are huge issues. They're going to engage us in political struggle for generations across this century. But let's assume for tonight, I cover this in more detail in the book, in the Zero Marginal Cost Society, but for tonight, let's assume that the human race will find a way to build the resiliency into this system. Here's the advantage of this new Internet of Things platform for a smart digital Italy and a smart digital world, a smart digital green world. Every one of us tonight has a value chain, whether we're a family or a small business or a cooperative or a nonprofit or a neighborhood association, we all have value chains. Every day we are marshalling economic activity from nature, we're shipping it, we're storing economic activity, we're producing economic activity, we're consuming economic activity. We're recycling economic activity. That's the value chain. What this means now is we have 3 billion people connected to the Internet and now the Internet of Things. I just come ba came back from China. Uh, the new premier, Premier Li, read my last book, The Third Industrial Revolution, by sheer chance. And now China is moving on the same plan as Germany with us. But I was with the vice premier. Premier Wang Yang, he said, Jeremy, we now have a smartphone in China for $25 with more computing power than sent our boys to the moon in 1969. So we're going to have everyone connected to the Internet of Things within the next 20 years. Everyone, everywhere, even if you're making $2 a day. So we can go up on this Internet of Things platform, the whole human race, and assuming it stays network neutral, Everyone has universal access. This means that every one of us has a transparent picture of the economic life of the world at any given moment for almost zero marginal cost. Even big companies didn't have this information up till now. If it's network neutral, it means all of us can engage as entrepreneurs, but in a social networks around the world, and we can remove the 1% and the 99% because the intermediaries can be knocked out of the equation. We can democratize economic life. Getting there is going to be quite a struggle to democratize economic life. But let me explain that here's how it works. Let's say you're a cooperative or an SME. You're a small and medium-sized enterprise here or in Cagliari. And here, here's what you can do, Cagliari. You can go up on the Internet of Things platform 
and cut your data out of the value chain. In other words, the data for your company or your cooperative. And you can take the data that you care about for your business and you can apply your own analytics. You can create your own algorithms for those analytics. You can create your own apps. It won't be rocket science. And you can then dramatically increase your aggregate efficiency. That's the ratio of potential to useful work. You can dramatically increase your aggregate efficiency at every step of conversion of goods and services that you're engaged with on your value chain, which allows you to dramatically increase your productivity, dramatically reduce your marginal cost so you can stay competitive in a very streamlined, global, smart, digital world. Some of the cost for some of the goods and services, the marginal cost are going to head to zero, near zero. It's never zero. Meaning those goods and services are going to be essentially free and abundant and shareable outside the market in the new sharing economy on the collaborative commons. Now, you're all, we're all hearing about the sharing economy. What is this sharing economy? Capitalism is giving birth. And the progeny is the sharing economy on the collaborative commons. This sharing economy, this little baby, is flourishing alongside its parent, the capitalist market. This sharing economy is the first new economic system to enter onto the world stage since capitalism and socialism in the early 19th century. This is a, a remarkable historical turning point. Now, like any parent-child relationship, the parent capitalism is trying to find ways, it's its first baby, to nurture the child, let it grow, let it develop, let it create its identity, but the parent's a little nervous about the child becoming too much of a competitor. Now, if you're a parent, you know that the, the child also transforms the parent. And in this case, the sharing economy is forcing that capitalist parent to change the whole way it views its mission, its philosophy, its organizational patterns in order to nurture the child. We are beginning to see a hybrid economic system right now emerge in the last couple of years. Part exchange economy, capitalist market, part sharing economy, collaborative commons. Share the cars, share the homes, share the toys, share everything. By 2050, capitalism will still be here. It'll be completely fundamentally altered, and I believe it will no longer be the exclusive arbiter of economic life on the planet. That's in 35 years from now. It's going to have to share the center stage with its grown-up progeny, the sharing economy, and find ways to value it as equal partners, which is good. That means we'll have the option to be property in a capitalist market, and we'll have an option to produce and share goods and services for nearly free on the sharing economy in the commons. Two choices for the human race, side by side. We have already seen what's made this sharing economy possible, and it's called near zero marginal cost. Now, in economics, we are always trying to encourage businesses to increase their technology and find more productive technology so that they can increase their productivity, reduce their marginal cost, so they can put out cheaper goods and services, win over consumers, and bring some profits back to their stockholders. Marginal cost is the cost after your fixed cost, the cost of the producing an additional unit of a good or service after you pay your fixed cost. So, in capitalism, we always want to reduce marginal cost. The optimum market in classical economic theory is where you sell at the marginal cost. Here's the problem, the paradox, the contradiction that Adam Smith didn't see, Karl Marx didn't see, Lord Keynes didn't see. It's the ultimate paradox of capitalism. None of us ever anticipated a technology revolution so extreme in its productivity that it could actually reduce marginal cost to near zero, meaning the goods and services are nearly free and not part of the market and shareable outside the market in abundance. That's what's happening. 
So when people first heard about the publication of the book, Zero Margin Cost Society, they said, well, this sounds like it's way off in the future, and I always smile. In the last 15 years, we have watched the zero marginal cost phenomena devastate, disrupt some of the biggest vertically integrated capitalist com companies in the world, unanticipated, in 15 years. It started with a little music service called Napster, N-A-P, uh, Napster, you know what it is. Today, as we sit here tonight, we have three billion human beings, including you in this room, and you are now prosumers. We have sellers still, and we have buyers. We have owners, we have workers. That was the first and second industrial revolution. They're still here, but now we have prosumers. At any given time on the communication internet, millions and millions of young people especially are producing and sharing their own music at near zero marginal cost. You produce some music, maybe it costs you a little money, and whether you share that music with one person on the web or a billion, the cost is nearly zero. We have young people producing and sharing their own YouTube videos, open source, no copyrights, and they're sharing with each other all over the world at near zero marginal cost. We have young people producing and sharing their own news blogs, their own social media. They're contributing to the knowledge of the world in Wikipedia. They're taking massive, open, online college courses taught by the best professors at near zero marginal cost. They're getting college credits. This is happening right now. Some of the biggest industries of the 20th century that we thought were invincible have gone down. The music industry is a shadow of itself. Everything is being produced for each other for nearly free. Television has shrunk because all the young people are producing and sharing videos on YouTube. Newspapers and magazines have gone out of business because of free blogs. I'm in book publishing 45 years. My newest book was on Pirate Bay before it was published, and they even ranked the book before Amazon. You can't beat these young people. It's pretty impressive. So we have seen the democratization of knowledge, entertainment, news, music, much of our culture, no longer arbitrated by content con companies and elite forces. This is the democratization of a big part of human life. But most of us thought that there'd be a firewall, a firewall, and that while the near zero marginal cost phenomenon has absolutely changed knowledge, news, and entertainment in the virtual world with the communication internet, it's also created thousands of new businesses, of course, not just Facebook, Google, and Twitter, but for every one of theirs, there's a Wikipedia and a Couchsurfing, which are nonprofit. So thousands of new enterprises emerge to aggregate this sharing economy, and lots of big companies have gone down. But we thought there'd be a firewall, and the near zero marginal cost phenomenon would not skip over the firewall from the virtual world to the physical world. We said that ain't going to happen. It's now happening. It's called the Internet of Things platform, third industrial revolution when the communication internet converges with a digitalized renewable energy internet and a digitalized automated GPS guided and driverless transport and logistics internet, we cross the firewall and we now have millions and millions of people right now producing their own solar, wind, geothermal energy at near zero marginal cost right now. And now we have a generation moving to car sharing vehicles, and within 10 years, those vehicles are going to be on automated systems at almost zero, a very low marginal cost. And we have a generation here in Italy with fabrication of 3D printing with recycled materials. We're heading to near zero marginal cost. This is a revolution. Now let's go back to Germany. What's happened in 10 years? It's all about energy. The energy internet's moving in Germany. 27% of the electricity powering this country of Germany is now solar and wind. We will be at 35% solar and wind electricity before 2020. We will be at 100% renewable energy by 2040. That's 25 years from now, well before then. The fixed cost of solar and wind technology, solar panels, thin film, 
wind turbines, they are on an exponential curve for 20 years. And uh, even politicians around the world don't know this. The curve is similar to what happened to computing. Now, I'm the oldest person, I'm sure, in this room. I'm a World War II baby. And when I was a kid, computers cost millions of dollars. And the chairman of IBM at the time, in the 1950s, said, we'll need about six computers, maybe seven. We did not anticipate the Intel computer chip, Moore's Law. And what Moore found out is the, we were doubling the capacity and halving the cost on computer chips every two years. So now China has a smartphone for $25. We have a similar curve now with solar and wind. A solar watt, one little solar watt of electricity from a solar panel cost $150 to produce in 1970. $150. That watt today can be produced at 65 cents and within two years, 35 cents per watt. And quietly, I chair a global consulting company of, of industries from around the world. And we have power companies in my group. And guess what they're doing? Privately, in Europe and America, power and electricity companies right now tonight are buying long-term 20-year contracts for solar and wind at 4 cents a kilowatt hour they know the exponential curves. It's over, over for fossil fuels and nuclear. It's done. We just haven't woken up to that fact. What's interesting is once you pay for the fixed cost and they're becoming as cheap, and they're going to be as cheap as smartphones, your geothermal heat pump, your bioconverter, your small vertical wind, within 10, 15 years, curves are there. But once you pay for that solar panel in Germany or that wind turbine, or the geothermal heat pump, guess what? The electricity being produced there is near zero marginal cost. The sun is not sending a bill over Germany. The wind is not invoicing in Germany. The geothermal heat pump, the geothermal heat, is not sending an invoice. It's all free. Just keep the solar panel clean, the wind turbine maintained, the geothermal heat pump in good condition. We have 27% of the electricity in Germany now is at near zero marginal cost. And what's interesting about this, what's interesting about this is there are four major power companies in Germany. EMBW, RWE, Vattenfall, and E.ON. We thought these giant vertically integrated global corporations were simply invincible 10 years ago. And guess what's happened to them? in 10 years. They're, they're experiencing the same fate as the music companies, book publishing, newspapers and magazine, and television. Millions of people in Germany, and I should say little Denmark with 4 million people is doing the same thing. So when I say here uh, in Sardinia, any region can do that. Just look at little Denmark's done the same thing. But in Germany, what's happened is millions of small players, consumers, farmers, Small businesses, small and medium-sized enterprises, neighborhood associations have created electricity cooperatives, shared commons. Every one of them got low interest loans from the banks. They didn't need government money. The banks gave the loans because they knew you could pay back with the energy savings and the premium for the energy. They're producing all the energy in Germany. The big four power companies are producing 7% of the energy. They're out of the game. They can't scale it because the new energies require the sun. You have to collect it wherever you live or work. And the wind and the geothermal heat, you have to collect it everywhere. It encourages cooperatives where millions of people laterally scale, not vertically scale. Big companies can't do it. This is power to the people. We're going to resurrect that term from 1968 for a new generation in 2015. This is actually happening now. Now, the big power companies might not go out of business. The ones that survive and flourish, the, the capitalist companies, they're going to have to now find an accommodation with the new child, the sharing economy. So we introduced a new business model about seven years ago. And we said, look, we now have millions of people producing their own green electricity and sharing it on the energy internet, cooperatives. We're going to have tens of millions in 10 years. 
We're going to have hundreds of millions of people doing it in 20 years. We're going to have the whole human race in 25 years on exponential curves. Developed world, developing world, absolutely producing their own electricity really cheap. We'll send it back to the grid. What's the role of the transmission companies? They can erect and manage the infrastructure for the grid, but it has to stay network neutral. And they're going to have to be regulated as public utilities. And the way they'll make money is by selling less and less and less electricity. How do you make money by selling less electricity? The transmission companies will set up partnerships with thousands of institutions, your, your homeowners, small businesses, big companies, nonprofits. And they will help all of the institutions by managing with them their big data on their value chains so that you and I, with our new analytics and algorithms and apps, can dramatically increase our aggregate efficiency at every step of conversion on our value chains, increase our productivity, reduce our marginal cost, and you know what? We will then share some of that productivity back with the electricity transmission companies. It's called performance contracting. So they will actually make more money by selling less electricity, and these companies that have polluted the hell out of this planet and taken us to extinction, their new business model is to dramatically increase our aggregate efficiency and reduce our ecological footprint and move us into renewable energy sharing. Not because they care, not because they're committed, but because that's the business model that will succeed. And we don't need them. If they don't do it, all sorts of companies, electron consumer electronics companies want to do this, ICT companies would like to do this, startups, small businesses, we don't need them. But they can join the game. It's not just Germany. After my first formal visit to China, and with the new premier saying, we want this for China, to show you how fast China moves, 11 weeks after my first formal visit with the government, China announced an $82 billion, $82 billion four-year startup to completely transform the electricity grid of China from servo-mechanical to digital, so that millions and millions and millions of Chinese people can produce and send back to the energy internet their own solar and wind. That's China joining Germany. It's a revolution. The coming together of the communication internet with the digitalized renewable energy internet makes possible the automated GPS guided driverless transport logistics internet. Here's the deal. We built the whole second industrial revolution global economy around car ownership. The car was the centerpiece of the 20th century. The problem is we have a generation of young people here in this room that do not want to own automobiles again and never will. It's called car sharing. And what's made car sharing possible is the beginning of the GPS-guided automated transport internet. So if you have a smartphone here, you can go up on your smartphone to the communication internet and say, I want a driver. Immediately, you're switched to the transportation internet and GPS, which connects you to a driver who's within 90 seconds of where you are. The driver picks you up, you go to your destination, and PayPal pays for you. So we have a new generation that doesn't want to own cars anymore. Grandma and grandpa, that's car ownership. Two cars sitting there doing nothing on the street. The young people want to move from ownership to access to mobility. Now, you recall the book I wrote, what was it, back in the year 2000, The Age of Access. I said the young people will move from ownership to access. My colleagues said, there you go again, never going to happen. It, thank you, all the young people here in car sharing. We are now ending car ownership and sharing vehicles. And I should say this, starting with the millennial generation, you, your children, your grandchildren, the curve is clear. You're never going to own cars again. You're going to be an automated, GPS-guided, driverless transport and logistics grid. So Larry Burns was the former executive vice president of General Motors until five years ago, a major player. He just did a study. He's a professor at the University of Michigan. It's in the book. He did a study of Ann Arbor, Michigan, a small, medium-sized city. And he said, even now, with the, uh, the transportation internet, it's young, but we can remove and eliminate 80% of the vehicles in this city tomorrow morning. Don't need them. 
The other 20 percent will give us, with car sharing, more convenience, better mobility, cheaper. So if you extrapolate Larry Burns' study, there are one billion cars, trucks, and buses in the world choking us in traffic, wasting our lives away, and they're the number three cause of global warming emissions, transport, logistics. The number one cause of global warming emissions is buildings, and in Germany, they, take in, they have 39 million buildings. They have retrofitted nine million of those buildings which has brought the entire construction industry back to work. Because you have to retrofit the buildings, then you put the solar, wind, and geothermal heat on, otherwise the buildings leak. They've retrofitted nine million buildings already, and two million of them are power plants already. So the number one cause of climate change buildings, we're going to make every single building in Italy, home, office, and factory, your own micro power plant to produce your own electricity, just like Germany, Denmark. The number three cause of tra is transport. I'm going to get back to that in a moment. Does anyone know what the number two cause of climate change by industrial activity is? No one talks about it. Even Al Gore won't talk about it. Beef production, beef consumption, animal husbandry, and agriculture. It's one-third of global warming. No one wants to talk about it for fear we might have to change our diet slightly and move down the food chain so we can live a healthy life respect our fellow creatures, and replenish the planets. It's shameful. The good news, the Mediterranean diet is the right diet for the world. Move down that food chain. But number three is transport. For every car shared, 15 cars are being eliminated from production. So what we're going to begin to see is 80 percent of the vehicles right now in the world are going to be eliminated in the next 25 years, I have no doubt, with an automated logistics system. The other 200 million cars, buses, and trucks, they're going to be electric. They're going to be fuel-celled. They're going to be running by near zero marginal cost energy on the energy internet. And they're going to be automated on smart road, rail, and water, and they're going to be driverless. Unless you think this is a long way off, the state of, Utah, the state of Nevada last week gave commercial permission to Daimler trucks, commercial right now, to have driverless trucks in the state of Nevada. It's going to follow everywhere in the next 24 months. All the car companies are ready, Daimler, GM. Right now, driverless trucks in Nevada on the highways. The communication, energy, and transport and logistics internet on top of an Internet of Things platform connecting every device means that in Italy and around the world, if you have a cooperative, a nonprofit, a small business, you plug your business into the platform and you dramatically increase your aggregate efficiencies and productivity, reduce your cost. Some of it at the capitalist marketplace, some for the sharing economy. 3D printing. How many people here are engaged with fabrication and 3D printing? Raise your hands. We got a few. It's a pretty big movement. My friend Ricardo Luna, I'll be with him tomorrow in uh, Genoa over at Repubblica. You've got a huge movement in Italy which is fitting because the best SMEs in the world are in Italy. 3D printing. We've got several million young people in startups, some of it profit-making, most of them cooperatives. And they are using open source software. They're sharing it around the world. No patents, no copyrights, because they're sharing. That means no cost. And they're using for their filament, their molten material, recycled plastic recycled metal objects, recycled paper. The only cost is collection. And what's interesting is the process of 3D printing is additive manufacturing. The molten material is, builds up as a single product. The software builds up layer after layer. You get one whole product with movable parts. You're using one-tenth of the materials because there's no material loss. If you've ever been in a traditional centralized factory, you take a big chunk of material out of nature, and you cut it up, throw some of it out, then you make the final product. Here, nothing's thrown out. Nothing. So they're beginning to use their own renewable energy off microgrids to actually power their fabrication factories. It's starting here in Italy and in Germany and some other countries. 
and some of the fabrication labs are using their own electric vehicles powered by their own renewable energy to get their 3D printed products to the market or the sharing economy. Now, President Obama wants every high school to have one 3D printer, which is amusing to me. Like the first computers. We used to do one computer per high school. But in 10 years from now, I guarantee you, every little kid, every little bambino in Italy is going to be in first grade with a little knapsack, with a $20 smartphone, and a $20 little 3D printer in first grade, no more Lego toys, and they're going to be learning how to recycle all the garbage in the neighborhood, and they're going to be Skyping in global classrooms, a whole generation, millions of young kids, and they're going to become as savvy in producing a whole array of increasingly sophisticated physical products at low to near zero marginal cost to share with each other in the sharing economy, just like their millennial parents became savvy in using software to produce and share virtual goods, entertainment, news, blogs, knowledge. Absolutely going to happen. Will big centralized companies disappear? Some will, some won't. The ones that stay will understand you have to be in the second industrial revolution and the third. It's not either or tomorrow morning. It's how does a responsible business person make a long-term shift in their business model quickly. So increasingly, the big manufacturers will have to play on an even playing field with the SMEs, because the SMEs are going to be the precision info factors that can scale cooperatives. The big companies can join and help aggregate the networks and help market and distribute. But they're not going to be the exclusive arbiters, and everyone else is going to be their little slaves. The SMEs, it's a renaissance. They can do it cheaper, laterally scaled cooperatives. Perfect for Italy. So the best way to understand this new economy is our young people are not only sharing their news blogs, their entertainment, their music, their renewable energy, and now their transportation, and finally their 3D printed products. They're even sharing their toys, their tools, their sporting equipment. The most interesting one to me is the toy websites. I don't know if you've seen these. They're now in Europe and they're in America. We got these millennial parents who are in their late 20s. They've got little kids now. And what's interesting is traditionally, a child was introduced to property and exchange property and markets by their first toy. And toys, commercial toys, originated in Ravensburg, Germany, this beautiful medieval town about 400 years ago. So a parent will bring home a little toy to their two and a half year old daughter, and they'll say, This didn't come from Santa Claus. Santa Claus comes at Christmas. We bought this toy for you at the store, and we're giving it to you, the little two and a half year old girl. And they say to her, This is your toy. We bought this for you. It's now your property. It's not your brother's toy, and it's not your sister's toy, and it's not your cousin's toy. It's your toy. Take care of it. Remember this? And the little child's thinking, what did mom and dad just say to me? My toy, not my brother or sister's toy. Power, status, property, control, negotiability. They're learning about property in capitalist markets. And I have no problem with that. But now, we got these millennial parents, and they go up on these toy websites where there are thousands of shared toys by age group. They buy a one-time subscription, and then they're into the shared economy. They can download any toy, and within the 10 years from now, those toys will be delivered by near driverless vehicles at near zero marginal cost energy and drones, low cost. And they're giving the little toy to their two and a half year old daughter and saying, this toy has a story. Another little child played with this toy. A little girl just like you, she had so much fun. She really enjoyed this toy, and she took very good care of it because she knew one day you'd play with this toy. And you should take very good care of the toy because you're going to have fun with it, and then one day someone else will play with the toy. The child is learning now the toy is not a possession to defend. It's not status. It's not power. It's not who they are. It is simply access to a moment and an experience of joy which then someone else can enjoy. They're learning to be part of the sharing economy. Share the cars, share the homes, share the toys, share the energy. It's a revolution up here. 
How do we finance this? I joined your prime minister. Your prime minister asked me to join him, Mr. Renzi, in Venice uh, last summer to issue a declaration called Digital Europe. And your prime minister said, we want to introduce the idea of a smart digital Europe. So I joined your young prime minister at his request in Venice. But I said, when we talked to the press, I said, you, we need to understand something here. Digital Italy and Digital Europe is not just about broadband, free Wi-Fi, and data. That's pretty narrow. It's actually digitalizing the entire infrastructure of Europe, communication, energy, transport, so that we can create new business models along the line I've talked about. So later I developed a memorandum after that first meeting for Claude Juncker and the European Commission, the Parliament, and for Sigmar Gabriel and others in Germany for digital Europe. It's open source. Google it up. We, it's available. And the first question in Brussels was, how do we pay for this? This is huge. And I said, if, you, if I can show you how we can pay for it tomorrow morning, can we get on with this? Here's how we pay for it. The money's all there. In 2012, in the EU, we spent $741 billion in U.S. dollars on infrastructure. One year, private and public investment across Europe. That's in a bad year. Italy spends huge amounts of money on infrastructure. Every country does. The problem is not the money. It's where we're feeding it. We're building new old, new old, meaning we're pouring massive amounts of money, our money, into an old second industrial revolution infrastructure, centralized telecommunications, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion and transport on road, rail, and water, and we can't get any more productivity out of that platform. If you're an engineer here, a quick aside. All the economists can't figure out why the productivity is waning in every country in the world, even with new killer products out of Silicon Valley. It's because they don't understand the aggregate efficiency of the platforms. The second industrial revolution platform, in 1905, we started with 3% aggregate efficiency, meaning on every conversion across that second industrial revolution, we lost 97% of the energy in trying to convert the product or service at every step. We lost 97%. And that includes, when we mean energy, we mean everything, raw materials, rare earths, metallic ores. By 1990, the U.S. got up to 13, 14 percent aggregate efficiency. Japan beat the world at 22 percent. Nothing's changed anywhere in the world since 1990. So if you're still on that same platform, there's no productivity we can get out of it. So if we simply reprioritize our investment in Italy, Europe, and the world so that every region of Italy, with European funds, regional funds, prioritize so 25 percent of what you would invest in infrastructure anyway, is in the new infrastructure. Lay it down, build it out across Italy, just reprioritize some of the monies. We'll be there in 20 years, in Sardinia and every region in Italy. Germany's doing it, little Denmark's doing it. Now my global team is doing it in all of northern France with Nord Pat Calais, the oldest industrial region in Europe. This can be done in Sardinia tomorrow morning. Finally on this, what industries will be involved in this transition, this infrastructure? Telecom cable, ICT, consumer electronics, transport, logistics, manufacturing, retail. That's a lot of industries. How will it affect employment? We have to take the whole region of Sardinia and transform this region from fossil fuel and nuclear power to distributed renewable energies. And you've got so much renewable energy. You have so much wind. You have so much solar on this island. You have enough for kingdom come. But to do this, we have to transform every single building in Sardinia over the next 20 years by retrofitting them. Then we put the power on them. That means your construction industry stay busy week in and week out. In Nord Pas Calais, we have 1.7 million buildings. We're going to convert all of them in the next 20 years. We're just starting. And that's going to keep our construction industry busy for 40 years. Then we have to take the entire electricity grid in this, uh, in, here in Sardinia and transform it from a dumb servo mechanical electricity grid to a smart digital one, energy internet. Who's going to manufacture all of the new meters for digitalization in every home, office, and factory? It should be manufactured in Sardinia. 
Who's going to install all that technology in every home, office, and factory? Skilled labor, lots of them. Then we have to take the transport grid of Sardinia and change it over from dumb to smart road and rail. And we're going to have to move it from internal combustion to electric and fuel cell transport. We have to have charging stations for our electric and fuel cell cars in every parking space in Sardinia, in every building. Who's going to install them? Who's going to make them? We're going to bring a lot of people back to work. It's already happening in places like Germany and Denmark. It can happen tomorrow morning here. If you have the political will, if the business community can move quickly, and if the communities and the civil society and the NGOs can lead the charge. Last thought. The reason I wrote this book is ultimately I've looked back at the last 45 years. I began working on energy issues in 1973 and on climate change in 1980. And I got it wrong all these years. I kept thinking we had more time. We are all terrified. All of us engaged with us are just terrified. There's no other word to use. And I know this sounds over the top if you're a parent or a grandparent. You need to listen to this. What is so terrifying about climate change, it's never explained. It changes the water cycles of the Earth. We are seeing the water cycles of the Earth change. We're the watery planet. We go to other planets, no water, not interested. Our ecosystems have developed over millions of years based on the water cycles in the atmosphere. For every one degree that the temperature goes up from industrial-induced climate change, for every one degree the temperature is going up, the atmosphere is sucking up 7% more precipitation from the ground. The heat is forcing the precipitation quickly into the atmosphere. We are getting more concentrated precipitation in the clouds, more extreme water events. Sound familiar? More violent winter snows. If you, were you in the New York City or Boston last winter? Eight feet of snow up to the second floor stories. We have more spring flooding, Europe all over the world. We have more summer droughts. We have more category three, four, and five hurricanes. We are out of water in California. We, we're trying salinization, but we're probably going to have to repopulate California. There was no water in Pakistan. There's no water in Sao Paulo. Low-lying countries are being clipped with hurricanes. The wind patterns across the Atlantic are forcing us to rethink how we have air travel. Our ecosystems cannot catch up with a runaway water cycle, and they are being exhausted. And our scientists tell us, and this is the biggest news we've had since we've been on this planet, we are in the sixth extinction event in real time in this century. We've had five extinction events over 450 million years. And each time, there was a chemistry change in the planet quickly, massive quick die out. 10 million years each time to recover new life. We are actually in the sixth extinction event now. And if you're a parent or a grandparent, our scientists tell us we could lose 70% of all the forms of life on Earth by the end of this century. We don't know if we're going to survive this. And as my wife says, we're not grasping the enormity of this. And we point out that 99.5% of all the species that have ever lived on this little planet, 99.5% have come and gone. And we're the youngest species. It's hubris to think we're going to make it into the next century. So what does this have to do with what I said tonight? The ability to create an Internet of Things platform, on top of which is a communication, energy, and transport Internet. It means that all of us, every day, with our little apps and our little mobile phones and our analytics and our algorithms, we're constantly finding ways in our value chains to increase our aggregate efficiency and productivity, which means we each are constantly, with our own data, finding ways to use less of the Earth's resources because we can use them more efficiently and not lose as much. We lower our ecological footprint dramatically because the whole human race is involved not just a few companies. And then if what we do produce and share, we do produce is shared. We share the vehicles, we share the toys, and we share the homes. It means more of us are less using less of the earth. It's a distributed, recycled, circular economy. Then if we can get every single region of the world, start with Sardinia, so you should be producing all of your own solar, wind, and renewable energy at near zero marginal cost across the Sardinian region within 20 years off fossil fuels. We can do it on these exponential curves. 
If Nord Pad Calais can do it in northern France and little Denmark and Germany, it can be done in Sardinia. So the mission here, I think, is clear. We have to call on this generation to wake up. And we need a commitment over the next three generations, maybe, maybe we have enough time to beat the clock on climate change. I don't know if it's too late. But I do know that what we've laid out here, the technology is there, and everything I mentioned tonight is happening somewhere. Why not here? Everything I mentioned is happening somewhere. Why not here? So I'm hopeful. I've spent 25 years in Italy, and I'm pretty frustrated. Not a single region has made the commitment yet. Yet this is the most creative country in the world, world class in architecture and clothes and fashion and food and electronics, and you're sitting on your seat. Why don't you start in Sardinia? Why don't you start with the 1.7 million people here tomorrow morning? Why don't you show the rest of the regions of Italy what you can do here, and maybe Italy will join the club with Germany, and now France is moving, and we can begin to turn the page, chart a new journey, democratize the economy, replenish the planet, reflourish life for our children and our fellow species. Good night. I was told we can do two questions. Who wants to be the questions? OK, what you have to do is you have microphones. We'll do three quick ones, very quick. It's late. Buonasera. Buonasera. Um, il prosumer diventerà il fulcro uh, della nuova economia. I don't have the um, earphones, so you, why don't you just translate for me very quickly? That's all right. In my next life, I'll learn Italian. OK. OK. Dunque, il prosumer. No, I need a, I need to. Can't someone just help me? Uh, is anyone that's. Uh, why don't you, will you translate? Go ahead, ask the question. OK. Go ahead. Se è vero che il prosumer diventerà il fulcro della nuova economia, Scompariranno le differenze nella distribuzione della ricchezza? Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's already beginning. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, if we're going to have prosumers who are producing and sharing with each other uh, freely in a sharing economy, will this change inequality? Absolutely. That's why a lot of state interests are not too interested in this. Because what we have here is a revolution. We have uh, the first and second industrial revolution. We had to rely on giant vertically integrated companies because they were the most efficient at creating economies of scale, but it led to the 1% and the 99%. To their credit, they put out cheaper goods, the workers were hired, and the workers formed trade unions to demand their just compensation. But what we're saying now is we can bypass them and engage directly with each other in the sharing economy and democratize economic life, digitalization allows us to produce and share for each other at near zero marginal cost for many things. It's the beginning of democratization. Okay, did you want to translate this? Here you go, no, no, come with the mic. Go ahead, very quick. Sempre più difficile. Allora, credo di poter riassumere così. La prima rivoluzione industriale aveva una struttura verticale, c'era l'1% dei soggetti che operavano sul mercato che lo gestivano integralmente e c'era un rapporto rovesciato rispetto alle masse, quindi l'1% gestiva tutto quanto e poi eh, bisogna dare credito a questo 1% che ha creato eh, anche l'industria moderna, così come la intendiamo noi, ha creato dei prodotti a costo ridotto ha generato anche il sindacato, perché il sindacato ovviamente è frutto di, questa, eh, di questo rapporto rovesciato. Il sindacato è nato per gestire eh, gli interessi di questa maggioranza che non aveva voce. 
Eh, quello che però succede adesso è completamente diverso, perché non c'è più un rapporto di forza, ma bensì c'è una condivisione. Okay. E, tu <ride> e tutti quanti eh, partecipano in maniera attiva, e questo succede nella terza generazione. Second question? Ok, someone take the mic and uh, ask the question and we'll be good. Sì, buonasera. Se è vero nelle, nei suoi libri che nel 2050 andremo tutto sulle rinnovabili, le risorse non rinnovabili da qui al 2050 come verranno gestite in questa economia che lei propone, che lei racconta? Uh, you got the date wrong. He said if in 2050 we'll be in renewable energy, what will happen to the non-renewable industries, correct? Yeah. You got the date wrong. The exponential curves are going to take most of humanity, including the developing world, they're going to leapfrog in by 2040. A lot of countries by 2030. If you look at Germany, for example, We just saw the new chart. They put out a map every year of how much energy is being produced, renewables in each region. There are entire regions of Germany, dark green now, that are producing all of their energy right now. All of it, renewables, right now. Whole regions of Germany. So 2030 to 2040, this is going to be here. Hopefully, if we have some good luck, good political leadership, smart business, and most important, committed communities. It isn't going to happen just because of the technology. Beh, eh, forse non sono stato chiaro. In realtà non si parla neanche del 2050, bensì del 2040 e anche del 2030. Eh, in Germania ci sono intere zone del paese che già sono alimentate da energie rinnovabili. E quindi il problema non si porrà perché le energie non rinnovabili non ci saranno più. Will be, uh, we are moving out. Oh, you forgot something. Yeah. <laughs> no, quello che invece eh, si sottolineava è il fatto che il cambiamento avverrà soltanto se ci sarà una classe dirigente capace di gestire questa transizione, ma non soltanto una classe dirigente, bensì anche delle comunità attive e proattive nel sostenere questo cambiamento. We are moving out of a carbon-based civilization in the first half of this century. However, there will be some places that are going to take longer to transition out of carbon. We're going to move out of it for electricity. We're going to move out of carbon uh, in agriculture. We're going to move out of pesticides and chemical fertilizers. We now have the science to do ecological-based organic agriculture with the same scale up. There are some industries, however, that we have to, uh, we have to make sure that we have the breakthrough technologies. For example, lubricants in the factories. Uh, another example is our construction materials, our cement. There are certain areas where we have to move with the life sciences together with the chemical sciences to begin to find biological so alternatives very cheaply and scaled in. That's going to take a little longer. But in terms of transport, mobility, electricity, we're going there. In the others, We need to put a fire under the life science industries to join the chemical industries to find biological substitutes that can scale cheaper and cheaper than fossil fuels. I'm confident we will do that in the same time period, but we haven't paid enough mindful attention to it. We need to do that next. Ci sono settori in cui questa transizione è più facile. Uh, L'agricoltura, ad esempio, è una di queste. Eh, perché si sta lavorando da molto molto tempo eh, su nuove tecniche di coltivazione, su nuovi eh, supporti alla crescita dei raccolti e ci sono invece dei settori in cui eh, la transizione sarà più lenta, penso ad esempio all'edilizia, a certi tipi di industria che utilizzano per esempio dei lubrificanti, ecco qui servirà uno sforzo congiunto invece da parte dell'industria, in particolare dell'industria chimica, affinché che si trovino dei materiali e dei modi di produzione che siano sostenibili. Here's the way I'll end. I'm not getting any younger. I spent 25 years in this country. 
I want to see one region of this country now move the rest of Italy forward. Do it here in Sardinia. Do it tomorrow morning. Do it for your children. Do it for the planet. Good night. Io vengo in Italia da 25 anni e non sono più giovanissimo. Vorrei che questo cambiamento avvenisse in Italia e vorrei che avvenisse in Sardegna, che cominciasse da qui. Fatelo adesso, fatelo per i vostri figli e per i vostri nipoti. Grazie mille a tutti.